If you spend quite a bit of time collecting fossils in the Paleozoic, then you'll be familiar with all the usual suspects, trilobites, brachiopods, and so on. But every now and then you find something different. And this is one group that tends to turn up and confuse everyone no end, and um, actually has quite an important place in the history of life. So today we'll be talking about conulariates. Conulariates are not generally common fossils, but they can turn up from the Cambrian and even the latest Precambrian, right up to the Carboniferous, and they can occasionally be quite abundant. So in some places they can be really common fossils, but most sites you won't see any at all, and usually you'll be surprised by one. It'll be a site that you've worked on for ages, and then suddenly you'll find something new, and it'll be quite distinctive looking, and quite large usually, and these things can be extremely confusing for anyone who's never seen them before. You can find them from deep water black mudstones, through shallow water sandstones and limestones, and they can appear in almost any environment. But they are, as a whole, quite distinctive. So once you get to know them, you will never mistake them again. So the basic structure is that you have a pyramidal shell made mostly of calcium phosphate and organic material. So by pyramid, pyramidal, I mean four-sided, steep, conical, often much taller than wide, and down the corners there is usually a sort of strut called a carina, and then the faces of it also often have a midline, but there are fine transverse lines or lines of little tubercles, little nodes all the way across them. So it's really quite a strikingly distinctive thing. Sometimes the conulariates are more or less circular in cross-section rather than pyramid-shaped, but they still have the, uh, the ridges down the corner, so you can still see the sort of eight-fold symmetry or four-fold symmetry, but with subdivisions. And unfortunately, this one is an internal mould. It's from the late Ordovician in Morocco, and that means that it's probably not identifiable because most of the detail that you use to identify them is on the outside. You need the external moulds or the actual the skeleton looking at the exterior to see all the ridges and the nodes and so on. It's probably an archaeoconularia by the looks of it, but um, can't really get any further than that on that one. The preservation can also vary quite a lot depending on whether the phosphate is preserved, whether the uh, conularite is flattened in a shale, whether it's in a limestone and three-dimensional. It can really look quite different. And I recently found one, for example, at a site called uh, um, which is known for pyritized fossil sponges and so on. But I've never found before a conularite at that site. And suddenly one turns up. And it is rather a strange thing, because it's preserved completely flattened, and with the phosphate totally dissolved. You can barely see that on there, I'm guessing. So let's have a look under the microscope. Sunflower is one of those sites where all the biominerals, calcite and so on, are dissolved or replaced by something else. And so what we're seeing here is just the carbon component. But you can still see this, the keel down the edge there. There's still just about a faint trace of transverse lines in places or little bobbly structures here and there, but all we're getting is a silvery film of organic carbon, effectively graphite. And so you can zoom around a bit, but you can also put the polarizer in. And at that point, once we brighten it again, all those reflective bits turn black and we can start to see more contrast in the actual detail. So now the keel is standing out really nicely. You can actually see some transverse lines going across there, little ridges. So there's some thickenings in the organic material, even though the phosphate isn't there. Unfortunately, it's not enough to be able to see the detail of the external ornament, and I suspect this one is never going to be identifiable. But you can still see a bit more with it if we stitch these images together and give you a, an overview of the overall shape of it. And then you find that after waiting 30 years, I've been to this site now, and I've been waiting all that time for one specimen and two come along at once. 
That's just how it goes with these things. They turn up when you don't expect them to quite often. And these two were probably attached to the same structure at the base, maybe a bit of trilobite or something like that. We'll never know because the slab is broken, it was just a loose piece lying around. But they clearly were there, but in very low numbers. That's one type of weird preservation, but here's another. This is in Silurian, late Silurian sandstones from um, the Herefordshire border. And you can see it's barely visible there. Under the microscope, the detail is really lovely. But what you find here is, again, the phosphate is almost entirely gone. And we're just left with the impressions of these little tubercles forming these nice chevron lines across the surface. It's extremely distinctive. But once again, we seem to have lost most of the skeleton in the process. OK, that tends to be how you find the things, or when they turn up at all. So the question then is, what on earth are they? There's nothing quite like them alive today. So they went extinct in the Carboniferous, and we've never seen the same thing since. But on the other hand, they do appear to have relatives. So this has been highly debated for quite a long time. They've been thought for a good long while that they were an extinct phylum, a major group of animals that has just disappeared. But they do show remarkable similarities to a group called the Coronate Scyphozoans. Specifically, it's to one part of the life cycle of these jellyfish, in which you have a polyp phase, which is attached to the seafloor, and that Part of that phase of the life cycle, which is a relatively minor part of it, most of it is spent as a normal jellyfish and swimming around in the sea, but that polyp phase secretes a theca, basically an organic covering made of chitin. And this theca shows remarkable similarity in the microstructure and in the overall form to what we see in conulariids. So the microstructure is a series of very thin layers, lamellae of organic rich and less organic rich material. There's no phosphate in it, but it is, it, it's a, there's a way that the structure is built up of these very fine layers is very similar. The tetravadial symmetry, this fourfold symmetry, is also a characteristic particularly of the Scyphozoan cnidarians, basically the jellyfish. And so all the evidence that we have points to some extent towards this group. And we even have a little bit of soft tissue. It's not very much. It's only been described in a few places, and it tends to be very incomplete. We never see the tentacles. But we do see structures that might resemble the muscles of these um, jellyfish. So as far as we know, these things probably were this group called or close to the group called coronate scyphozoans. So they are a group within the phylum Cnidaria that includes jellyfish, coral, sea anemones, that sort of thing, and probably within the crown group of Cnidaria, so the major group of living examples. But they evolved on the branch leading to the jellyfish or within that branch, which is quite interesting because that means that they're a relatively advanced group of Cnidarians. If we look at the phylogeny, the evolutionary history of uh, cnidarians, then what you see immediately is that there are several branches within the cnidaria that must have happened to major groups of cnidarians before this split from the coronate scyphozoans. So the first example of a conulariid in the fossil record has to postdate the origin of cnidarians by some distance. And this is particularly interesting because, in my opinion anyway, the first example of fossil conulariids, the oldest example, is actually the oldest example we have of an animal in the fossil record that we can definitively say is an animal, and more importantly, we can actually say which group it belongs to. So these are known from uh, both Russia and Brazil from the very late part of the Ediacaran period. In the Brazilian case, it may be pretty much at the Cambrian boundary, but it's there. And it, is, it has even been placed into a known genus. So this particular one is a relatively well-known fossil. 
the Russian ones are a little different in that rather than having fourfold symmetry, they appear to have sixfold symmetry. None of the later conulariates show anything like weird symmetry, except for the, in the early Cambrian. And at that point, you get everything from threefold up to fourteenfold. There's a whole range of different conulariate like organisms, many of them showing no phosphatization. They look like they were soft, so they didn't actually deform in a way you'd expect if it was biomineralized. And therefore, in that sense, they're closer to the modern coronates. But they have this weird range of symmetries going on. And they show some of the same sort of ornament, these ridges on the outside, but not the full ornament. So it looks like this group was diversifying quite spectacularly around the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, and then settled on just this one fourfold symmetric group, actually carrying on and becoming quite a major group of fossils up until the Carboniferous. There are certainly a lot more out there to discover, though, and including quite a lot of new ones, I expect. So I just want to finish with one of the weird things from Castlebank. So this one we originally thought was a paleoskeletal worm, because you can see the very fine microstructure of little dots arranged like the, uh, the plates across the annulae of worms, and um, they form sort of worm-like shapes. But occasionally there were these odd little black lines running along the length of them or across them in odd angles. And these were baffling for us for quite a long time, until we finally turned up a complete one. Which showed that it is basically, as far as we can tell, a conulariate. Now, Castlebank is one of these weird sites where biominerals like phosphate are pretty much entirely dissolved. But still, the way this deforms, the way we mostly find it as tiny little torn fragments, suggests that it is probably something which wasn't biomineralized in the first place, or at least had very, very little biomineral material. So what is this? Is this a derived group of conulariates that um, just happens to be unique to this area? Is it a remnant of a non-biomineralized group like the coronate uh, Scyphozoans, possibly closer to them than normal conulariates are? Is it something which actually existed for quite a long time through the Paleozoic and quite widely, but is barely fossilized because it didn't have a phosphate skeleton. There are a lot of unanswered questions in this one, and we still only have one really good complete specimen. So it's something to work up to in future, and hopefully it'll tell us something more about the evolution of this really interesting group, which I really recommend you keep a close eye open for. and. Um, really appreciate when you do find them because they are lovely things with a very interesting part in the history of life. So thank you once again for tuning in and thank you especially for making this channel actually work so far. Up to 130 subscribers which is amazing considering we've only been going about a month and um, hopefully it's onwards and upwards from here and I'll be able to devote more time to this in future, answer more interesting questions. There's plenty on the list already to do, and um, get into some really intriguing areas of the history of life and its modern equivalents today. So, thank you again, and I will see you again soon. Oh, and for anyone too young to remember, that tuning in thing is goes back to when you actually had televisions that you had to turn the knobs to get to the right frequency. I still remember them. My mum had one quite recently. Oh well.